Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2023, our election issues and personalities tracking program. I am Ladi Akere Doluale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on today's edition, Things Vote Buying and Selling, actually shows that the votes of Nigerians are now very important. My guest also says the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, is still working with the G5 governors to bring them into the tent ahead of the general election. Roadmap 2023 talks to former Minister of Aviation and now Director, Voter Intelligence and Strategy of the PDP Presidential Campaign Council, Osita Chidoka. Osita Chidoka, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Let me, let me uh, start by asking you about what your view is about the campaigning so far ahead of this election in uh, uh, February and in March. Um, a lot of what has happened can be described as mudslinging, uh, whereas people were anticipating uh, issue-based campaigns uh, at the start of the process. What do you make of it? Well, I guess um, Nigeria is witnessing a different kind of election. Um, the election is no, is no more the two-party election. Um, there is a lot of interest in the election. A lot is at stake, and inc the incumbent is not running. So um, everybody is trying to get a share of the mind of Nigerians. And all the issues coming up are issues that have dogged um, Nigeria for a while. So I understand you clearly. People are not focusing on policy. People are not focusing on what they will actually do in the office. Um, but a lot of time has been spent, especially by uh, one of the major political parties. They've spent all their time trying to throw mud, and that has elicited reactions from others. Given that scenario, uh, do you fear a situation where, at the end of the day, because the elections are just around the corner now, just a couple of days away, that at the end of the day, voters will be going to the polls without being able to clearly define what each of the candidates stand for, what they promise to do, and therefore, if any of them gets elected, nobody will be able to hold them to account because they didn't say anything. Well, that will not be a fair conclusion because um, some of the parties have been very articulate about their views. Uh, the PDP, for instance, my party has been very clear with the, uh, the five-point agenda. We've been very clear about unifying the nation, securing the nation, uh, providing education, and then uh, we've been very, very clear about restructuring Nigeria, about devolving powers more to the local authorities. Um, so I don't think that many Nigerians will go into that election not knowing what to expect from an Atiku and Uwaka. Uh, securing the nation is very paramount in his views. Um, restoring the economy, taking back what the locals have eaten, and, and making sure that a market-driven economy is thriving in Nigeria is something that many Nigerians, I'm sure, attribute to Atiku and Uwaka. The other side of this, of course, is that many will also argue, as indeed many of the opponents uh, in uh, other parties have argued, that most of these problems that you're talking about, I mean, if you take security, for example, started with the PDP. The Boko Haram phenomena started under a PDP federal government in Nigeria. And that uh, the PDP, therefore, cannot point fingers about the issue of security, that because it failed Nigeria on that score when it was in power. So um, that's an interesting narrative, and I believe that those who push it is because Nigerians in 2015 voted for the APC, and they have been in power since 2015. And since the time they came to power, banditry, um, Boko Haram, um, the IPO, um, violence of the unknown government in the, in the Southeast, the Southwest is under stress and tension. Um, the Niger Delta is under stress. This was never witnessed in Nigeria under the PDP. But given so that what is happening today yes, is that the APC has failed to manage Nigeria. They have failed because they said they were coming to power on a clear mandate to uh, restore security, but they have delivered insecurity to Nigerians. But the point I'm making is that Yes, they did promise that they were coming to restore security, but that speaks to the fact that it was the PDP that created 
the insecurity that they were supposed to come and fix. Uh, many people will, may agree with you when you said they haven't done that, but the point is that the PDP started it. And so why should we trust those so who the started PDP, it to fix the it? PDP did not, the, the PDP did not start it. That's a false narrative. The PDP did not start it. PDP was in power from 1999 to 2014. In fact, many argue that it was the effort by the APC to come to power that they tacitly supported militancy in, the, in certain parts of the country to ensure that they hound PDP out of office. But that cannot be true because the PDP Boko, from 1999, Boko from 1999, the Boko Haram started in 2007, eight time frame. It was 2009 time frame that the Boko Haram issue started. It and had PDP been a was preaching, in power. It was a government. It was it was people that were preaching at that time and then turned into a violent group. And the uh, the, the presence of somebody in power when a violent group emerges doesn't support the fact that that government cannot fight it. In, in Colombia, the government has been able to fight the drug lords. After many years of elections of various, of various governments, um, the governments were united in the fight against evil. So we have an evil situation in Nigeria. We have a situation that has created violence against Nigerians, loss of life in Nigerians. In, 19, in 2014, people were going between Abuja and Kaduna every day. But today, people can't do that. So what is, what is at issue is not where it started from. It is the resolve of a nation to secure its citizens. Should be paramount to any government. Indeed. The PDP was fighting the Boko Haram. We expended, we, we expended a lot of energy, uh, men and materials to contain the Boko Haram in, in the in Boronu area. And it was members of APC that said an attack on Boko Haram is an attack on the North. But then the APC then went on to APC fight. Member. The, the APC has gone on to fight Boko Haram, and today the reports, I mean, depending on who you speak to, the reports are that uh, all the territories that were being held by Boko Haram under the PDP administration in Borno, for example, have been recovered, and that many of the people who were living there have gone back home. False narrative. Absolute false narrative. People cannot travel between Abuja and Kaduna today. You are talking about Borono. People can go to Sokoto by road. People can go to the Zaria road. People can go um, to the southeast. People can move from one part of Anambra State to the other. People can travel between Ekiti and Ondo, and you're talking about Boronu. If you say that, if the, not the, the southeast, for example, that you mentioned, uh, until more recently, all the governors in the southeast were PDP governors, apart from uh, Abga, which was in Anambra State. And the situation in the southeast was very, very bad. It's still very, very bad. Uh, and all those states are being controlled by the PDP. So the question is, if that is the scenario, why should again, Nigerians trust PDP again, with this power? Is, again, 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 this is an absolute um, um, standing logic on his head. Security How? of Nigerians is a function of the federal government. The federal government controls the police, the army, the, sec the state security department. They control the prisons. So what is this talk about um, PDP governors? Therefore, by your argument, in all the states in the northwest where there is bandit renown, the APC governors will be held responsible. The they killings have been accused. in Kaduna will they have be held responsible by APC governors. No, it Mr. Not, Chidoka, they have the been point. accused. The point is the federal, government, the federal government has failed in the discharge of the single responsibility that the federal, the Constitution of Nigeria gave to the federal government. What, are your, what is your party going to do about it? a single responsibility. What is your party going to do about it? So, we're going to devolve powers to the state governments to play the role of, of, um, of what we call security officers of their state in reality. Nigeria is under-policed. Nigeria's process of engagement, training, and upgrade of our security situation is poor. So we need to revamp how we recruit police officers. We need to revamp how we train police officers. We need to revamp how we look after them when they lose their lives in the pursuit of security of lives and property of Nigerians. Then we need to think about how we can do community policing, how the local authorities in every locality, in every government can come together to work with the federal government to fight criminality in their locality. Then we need to go into the issues that are causing tension 
amongst Nigerians. And those issues are going to be looked into in such a way that we can be finding both short-term and long-term solutions to it. It is the failure to engage Nigerians on these issues that is causing this tension in Nigeria today. You mentioned the issue of unification earlier as one of the, uh, uh, the five pillars uh, of what the PDP intends to do, unifying uh, uh, the country, or depending on how you want to look at it, reunifying uh, uh, the country. How, what's wrong with the unity of the country and what, are you, what is your party going to do to reunify it, as you say? So, um, uh, first, if you take a cursory look at the manner the APC government has managed our national diversity, um, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, the appointment of security chiefs in the whole of the organizations that we have today in security, all the key heads of those parastatals are from one part of the country. Uh, we need to look at that again. We need to look around the manner of the issues that are concerning Nigerians, that is a, uh, what I call the default issues that concern Nigeria. Managing our diversity will mean that a federal government will be responsive to the needs of Nigerians. They will be responsive for, the, for inclusiveness. They will be responsive to the idea of the federal character that is enshrined in our constitution. This government has done very little to manage those issues. And I believe that the PDP has a history of managing our national diversity, and we will do it again. Speaking about unity, there, there is the argument, of course, that uh, for a northern Muslim to succeed another northern Muslim in spite of party does not speak to the unity of Nigeria. Uh, there are those who have made the argument, for example, that it is the turn of the southeast to produce Nigeria's president because everybody else has had an opportunity to do so. Uh, and that it is the turn of the Southeast. Uh, you are from the Southeast. So, I mean, apart from the fact that, that that is your home region, what do you make of that argument, uh, especially because you are supporting another candidate uh, who is not from the Southeast? It's a, it's a very, very valid argument that is the turn of the Southeast um, to produce the president of Nigeria. It's a very valid argument. Um, first of all, I will start by saying that in the two political parties, I campaigned seriously that these two political parties should zone the presidency to the southeast. But if you notice, the APC and the PDP members, key members of the APC and PDP from the south, insisted that the zoning is to the south and not to the southeast. That's why Bola Ahmed Tinubu is running, because he didn't want to agree that the zoning should be micro zone to the south. That's why some governors from PDP from the South South were running because they didn't want to agree that it will be micro zone to the Southeast. And my argument is that if it is coming to the South and it is not coming to the Southeast in these two political parties, then the zoning might as well continue from any other part of the country, which is the Northeast or the North Central or the Southeast, the three zones that have not ruled Nigeria. The Northwest have ruled Nigeria for about 11 years. Uh, between Yaradua and General Buhari now. The Southwest has ruled Nigeria for eight years and another eight years as vice president. The South South has ruled Nigeria for about five years. So it means that amongst the six geopolitical zone, if it's coming to the South, it should come to the Southeast. And if it is coming to the North, it should go to the Northeast or the North Central. So my argument is that in the political party I belong to, if it wasn't going to be zoned to the PDP, then another zone that hasn't, witnessed, uh, that hasn't tested the presidency can then run for the presidency. Because if a Southerner that is other than the Southeast takes the presidency, then they push the Southeast almost about 16 years away from the presidency. So that's the logic. Now, when it comes to the issue of whether it's the, um, the PDP having not given the ticket, the Anibo man not having won the ticket of PDP, what should be the Igbo response to it? My argument is that there are two pathways. So people can go to another party and run as a third party candidate. But I am of the view, and very considered view, that the two party state offers Nigeria the possibility that any ethnic group can become president once you get the ticket of one of the two parties. And that ticket of the two parties must keep moving from zone to zone. So once you go into a three-party, four-party race, then you devolve Nigeria back to voting across our fault lines. 
the two parties force us to vote against our fault lines. You must create an alignment for people to win. So that is why I'm of the view that if the Northeast goes for the presidency now, there will be a firm agreement within the PDP that the zoning is not to the south, but to the southeast. And that's what I hope to see happen in PDP um, after we win the election. The other thing, of course, which this unity uh, 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 principle, which you talk about, uh, has brought to light, especially, and I like the fact that you've given this uh, explanation about why you are supporting who you are supporting, given the context, is that there are others who believe uh, more stringently in what you said, although they have also pointed out that um, the situation where the national chairman and the presidential candidate of the PDP are from the north uh, is, does not speak to unity. In fact, there's a G5 group of governors uh, who are all uh, uh, southerners with the except, uh, exception of one uh, of them who is from uh, North Central saying, look, this cannot be allowed to stand and if the PDP does not rectify this, it cannot be trusted on the issue of unity or unifying the country. Uh, now that, we, for some of your members who have spoken to, they say, look, this seems to be deja vu all over again. This was something that had been witnessed in 2015 when, again, the number five, five governors walked away and the PDP lost that election. What, 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 what do you make of the whole uh, saga, the idea behind it, and uh, what's, got, what's got to be done? Well, there's a difference between 2015 and 2023. In 2015, five PDP governors that were second-term governors walked away from the PDP at the Eagle Square, and they went ahead to join another political party. In 2023, the five governors are still PDP members and are saying that they want certain things changed inside the PDP. So they are all candidates of the PDP. Four of them are candidates of the PDP. The three governors are running for Senate. One is running for re-election. Um, so I believe that this is a different situation. This is a family conversation. So it's either it's, um, two ways. The chairman of the party goes um, before the election or he goes after the election. Um, in either case, I think it will satisfy the issues, knowing that the election of the chairman is a statutory thing, is a legal issue. He was elected at a convention, and we think that this will happen again um, after, if, even if he resigns, the chairman by our constitution remains in the north. Because our constitution says when a chairman goes, a chairman from his zone, the deputy chairman from his zone will take over from him. So that is why at the time when, um, at the time when um, Muazu was the chairman of the, uh, not, um, um, not Muazu, Bamanga Tuko was the chairman when he left, Adamu Muazu took over from him. The same time with when Audu Obe left, um, Amadu Ali took over from him. So the chairman that will take over is from the zone. But after the election, we will then have to call a, a national uh, um, convention and rezone the chairmanship and get the chairman to now go to another zone. Given that, uh, I, I saw that when you did the analysis of the G5, you left out uh, the man who is easily the most prominent member, and that's the one who is not seeking re-election, but he's been the most vociferous in his opposition on this subject. Um, many of those who are out looking in uh, say that, you know, he's not been uh, brought into the tent. There's uh, an American... Uh, 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 a way of putting it where they say, look, shouldn't you rather have this man inside the tent uh, pissing out than outside the tent pissing in? Uh, because he's still insisting that he's going to support, uh, uh, he's going to announce his own presidential candidate, and many are assuming that will not be Alaji Atikwa Bakar of the PDP. Well, we look forward to that. You have no intention of reaching out to him? We are reaching out to him, and we are politicians. The politics is the art of the possible, so we are reaching out to him. But we'll see how that goes in the next couple of weeks to the election. Let me leave that and then come to another, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, controversy as well. Many would have expected that uh, former President Olusha Gwambasunjo would have been uh, one of your biggest backers in the PDP, having been uh, president on its platform 
and then, of course, subsequently chairman of its board of trustees. Uh, in 2015, uh, he didn't endorse the PDP candidate. Uh, in 2019, he didn't. And now in 2023, he has gone as far as to endorse the Labour Party candidate. Uh, 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 that's Mr. Peter Obi. Is this something that the PDP is working on? Because like him or, or, or dislike him, former President Obasanjo is an important voice in the polity. Indeed, President Obasanjo is a very important voice. And um, for me personally, he's uh, my benefactor and uh, a father figure in my life. So I, I give him um, the latitude and the credit that he can make his own decisions and come to his own agreement. Um, I thought that in 2015, uh, he endorsed the APC candidate, uh, General Buhari, and in 2019, he endorsed Atiku Abubakar, and in 2023, he has made his choice, and, I, and um, there's nothing we can do about that. It, it, it's his choice. He's no more a member of the PDP by his own um, decision. So I think that this is uh, well within his remit to take a decision on who to so support in an election. The man that he's supporting uh, has energized this race uh, and has turned it from a two-party race, which you alluded to earlier on, into more of a three or even depending, as you said, to a four-party race. Uh, and that tends to have uh, made the political dynamics a lot more fluid uh, now that it seems as if there are four parties in the running instead of just the normal two that we have been used to. Uh, uh, more or less uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Um, do you think that that muddies up the waters in terms of the political calculations about where votes can come from and who can get those votes uh, uh, in 2023 since there seem to be so many choices on offer? Oh, definitely. That changes the dynamics of the, um, of the race. Uh, that changes the dynamics of the race. Um, because uh, PDP's main, um, um, what I would call the base support of PDP, the South East, South South, um, is now far more fluid than it will have been without a P2B. So uh, I believe that that introduces fresh dynamics into the race. Like I said earlier somewhere else, he has disrupted the race. And it is for the two political parties to look at the lesson of this disruption, see how they will understand it, and what he means for the party in re-engaging the Nigerian young people and the Nigerian middle class. Those are the two areas that are, um, in my view, that are very angry with the two political parties. So this race, either way it goes, changes the dynamics of politics in Nigeria. The two parties must come back to re-engage um, these audiences. You can no more take them for granted. Well, if you look at it, is it, is it right? Someone told me that Actually, in real fact, you've got three PDP candidates against the APC amongst these four. Uh, Peter Obi was in the PDP. <laughs> uh, uh, Rabiu Kwankweso was in the PDP. Alaji Atiku Abaka is in the PDP. And then you have uh, Senator Tinubu in the APC. And that uh, possibly uh, is quite, it, it, it quite imaginable that one or both of the other candidates uh, uh, may, in fact, uh, be at the end of the day pulling away votes from the PDP uh, that it would get if they were not running on the platform of other parties. How do you see this dynamic? Yeah, this is a very interesting dynamics, but also don't forget that um, uh, politics is always moving paths. Uh, dynamics of politics is that alliances change, uh, people change position, and I believe that um, what is going to happen is that yes, PDP will have uh, substantial challenges in his base, but it will also gain new grounds in places that he has been losing for quite a while. Uh, PDP has been losing votes in the core north since 2003. Um, from then, it has gone progressively down to the time when PDP ended up being a South East, South South party with smattering of votes from the middle belt. So we think that uh, what we do in this election is to expand the base of the PDP. Uh, get back Northern voters to see PDP as that party that is capable of delivering value to Nigerians, of putting food on the table, of putting food in their stomach. Uh, PDP has a history of making sure that Nigerians can once again eat. In, 19, in 1999 to 2007, the economy was unstoppable. 
I mean, it grew to the point where we had almost $63 billion, both in foreign reserve and in excess crude account. We get to the point where Nigeria's balance sheet was cleaned out. We paid off our debt, 18 billion for the $30 billion we were owing. It came to the point where the middle class saw substantial growth. The sale of government properties in Abuja created uh, property owners among civil servants in Nigeria. The largest transfer of wealth from government to private to individuals. We did that transfer of wealth. The privatization unlocked Nigeria's economy. The aviation sector, the various sectors of the economy that is booming today is courtesy of PDP's foresight. Um, if you look at what we call the Fiscal Responsibility Act that made it possible for governments not to borrow against a certain limit, this government has violated those rules about our fiscal responsibility, but that had made sure that Nigeria will not get back again to its debt burden of issue. If you look at the consolidation of the Nigerian banks, it is possible now today to raise money for big ticket events, courtesy of the vision of the PDP. If you look at Nigeria across all indices, uh, you will see that the, the energy of the PDP, the intellectual um, capacity that we deployed in government, the bringing of professionals together in governance has made it possible that even the agriculture revolution that we talk about today, the, paddy, the rice paddies, the rice processing that is going on in Nigeria today, is courtesy of the PDP. The vehicle manufacturing going on in Nigeria, whether it is Inosin or Nissan or those who have set up um, uh, CKDs, bringing in CKDs and assemble in Nigeria, was a decision of the PDP government to allow for local production. So across all parts of the economy, across all parts of human development, uh, the PDP started the private universities in Nigeria. So you can see that today there are over 100 private universities in Nigeria, powering um, education across all sectors, giving more opportunities to the millions of Nigerians who cannot go to government universities. So I believe that Nigerians, once again, needs a government, a party that has a, the foresight, the capacity, to engage the policy bandwidth to change the dynamics of Nigeria. And we have done it before, we will do it again. Nigeria was worse than it was in 1999 when PDP took it over and restored it back as a major economy in Africa, the largest economy in Africa with the largest GDP. Once again, we have the opportunity, we'll go back to the basis. We will remove the obstructions that are in the economy and restore back that capacity that we are known for. And I believe that um, Atiku Abubakar presents a great opportunity for Nigerians. He presents an opportunity because he is a man that has shown strong resilience. Uh, I would like to have that kind of resilience, not giving up in the face of adversity. He has also shown a, a man of courage that despite all the attacks on him, despite all his former bosses about him, he has maintained a dignified silence. He has the toughness of the skin to take in the criticism, but take the decisions that will move Nigeria forward. I think that is something very important. Even amongst the G5 and all the accusations against um, Atiku Abaka, he has maintained a dignified silence. He has shown that he has the toughness of skin to take difficult decisions. He has shown that he has the capacity to move forward. So I think that all the years of his um, efforts to be presidency, his failures has chastened him. He has the humility, he has the capacity, and he has the investment and the drive to make Nigerian economy come back to what it was before the APC government come. And I think Nigeria should give us that opportunity once again. Let's look at the trends and the patterns here. Um, especially because of what, of, of what you've just said. Now, uh, the six geopolitical zones, uh, prior to uh, uh, 2015 or 2019, as you said, uh, the South-South and the Southeast were basically PDP territory. Um, and there were uh, parts of the North that were also PDP territory. For a time, uh, in the Southwest, there were parts of it that were PDP territory. That map has changed largely now uh, from 2015 to date. Up north, uh, barring one or two, or at most three states, uh, the PDP uh, is, not any, is not on ground in terms of governance in any of the states in the north, uh, apart from, I believe, it's Taraba uh, and Bochi now. Um, again, uh, in the middle Adamawa, belt, Sokoto. Okay, and Adamawa and, Adamawa as, and Sokoto. As a, in the case of Sokoto, as a result of decamping, uh, of the governor uh, from APC. No, but no, the no, point, no, the governor, yeah, yeah. Yes, he decamped. Yeah, he won back the, as a PDP governor. Yes. He won he, back his second term as a PDP candidate. I concede that. But the, po the point I'm making is that the map has changed. The map has changed. In the Southwest mm. right now, you have just one PDP governor, whom you referenced as one of the G5 
who will be seeking re-election. No, I want we you have to Oshun. take a look. We have Oshun. We have a governor in Oshun. Who has just come in, yes. Now, I want you to take a look yes. at the map as it stands, the political mm. map today, mm. and, and, and try to mm -hmm. explain, you know, the mathematics of how this could possibly play out uh, in such a way that not only does PDP get the plurality it requires, it also gets the constitutional requirements of the percentages even in the places where it doesn't win. It is very simple. PDP has um, strong organization, has presence. I will tell you something about PDP winning in the North. So if you look at a state like Bauchi, it was an APC incumbent governor that was defeated by the PDP. He was a first-term governor, and he was defeated by the PDP in 2019. If you go to Adamawa, it was an APC governor that was defeated in his first term by the PDP. If you go to Oshun, it was an APC governor that was defeated by the PDP, an incumbent governor. In all the states where the elections has been clean and the people has been mobilized, PDP has defeated incumbent APC governors. So I need you to make, to make that point. And if you take that to the local government elections that was conducted in Kaduna by the current administration, the governor Rufai government in Kaduna, you will see how PDP performed in that local government election. If you come to Abuja municipal, you see the election, uh, Abuja local government, the last local government election. You see how PDP performed in, those local, in that local government election. So I think that what is important for us is that the election is clean, free, and fair, and that we as PDP have the freedom, the wherewithal, the no harassment from the security forces. The president is promising us a clean election. We believe him, we trust him on this, and we believe that if it is done, Nigerians will remember the party that put food on their table. Nigeria will remember the party that is going to make them eat once again. Nigeria will remember the party that will make it possible for them to travel again by road across various parts of Nigeria. That party is the PDP, and that is the magic of the PDP. They, they may not want to travel by road since they can travel by rail, and that was not done by the PDP. That was done by the APC. Uh, I don't know if you are correct. The Abuja Kaduna line that they were applying was started and concluded under the Jonathan administration. Well, there's contention The plan over for the Lagos Ibadan and Lagos, there's no contention. I was a cabinet minister. The rail was completed. <laughs> So it started but operating it was, since the government, APC government came. Yeah, but certainly the other rail, even so if I were to concede that, I didn't. I didn't concede yes. that, but let's even assume that for the purpose of this. No, you, no, you don't, we you don't have to. That. You have to face, no, you have to face facts unless you are. No, it was President that Buhari that, that commissioned biased. it. It was yes, President yes. Buhari that commissioned so it. So the commissioning Remember of that. a That's project, a the commissioning of a project is not the building of a project. No, they, they said that they completed commissioned it. the four airports. They commissioned the four airports in Nigeria. But the four airports were started and built by the PDP. We borrowed the money. We paid the 100 million counterpart fund. As at the time I left as minister, I had, I had ordered the tiles and everything for the finishing of the work. So the fact that Mr. they commissioned it is what happens in government. You can start a project and another will conclude it. But that doesn't mean that you started the project. Okay, but you haven't told me about the trends and the patterns that I talked about. You said it's quite easy, so but I've you mentioned you the, the north. I've told you, I sent it I, made it, I made it simple for you to see that in the south, we defeated an incumbent APC government in, uh, in, um, in, in Oshun. Oshun. In Niger Delta, in the south-south, in the states of Cross River, Akwa Ibom, um, Edo, Delta, Rivers, PDP is going to be a strong player. PDP is going to be the party to beat in, that, in those localities. If you come to the Southeast, uh, PDP is going to struggle against the Labour Party uh, because the Southeast you know, feels very strongly about the Labour candidates. And he's, uh, like I said, he has disrupted the race. So he's, he's, he's going to be uh, PDP coming second place, probably in the Southeast, and that's, uh, that will work out for us. Um, if you go to the North, we will be competing with APC in their seven states in the Northwest, and we are most likely to lead in most of those states in the Northwest, competing with the APC. In the Southwest, we are going to see us competing again with the minus Lagos, where it's going to be um, APC, Labour Party, and PDP. In most of the Southwest, PDP will be the number two state in the Southwest. I concede that the candidate of APC will do well in the Southwest. Uh, if you come to the North Central, it will be a scramble. 
um, some of the states will vote for Labour, some will vote for APC, some will vote for PDP. So I see that as a split. In the Northeast, uh, PDP is going to do well in at least five of the states in the Northeast. So I, I don't see how we, um, the geographical map or the demography voting in Nigeria will go against us in this election. The, the thing, of course, that uh, you talked about will all be possible only for as long as uh, security, which we referenced at the start of the interview, uh, uh, makes it possible for INEC to deploy uh, for the voting to take place, for voters to be able to exercise their franchise without uh, hindrance or without fear of attack uh, by insurgents or known gunmen or kidnappers or whatever you want to call it uh, uh, in different parts of the country. How confident are you uh, 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 that that will in fact be the case uh, in 2023? I don't know. It doesn't have to do with my level of confidence, but I am convinced that Nigerians wants to, want to bring an end to the APC government as it is today, and that whatever we need to do to bring it to an end, I don't think anybody will like a situation where we go into a quagmire of no election, government in power's time has ended, and we cannot move forward as a nation. Um, I don't think that will be in the interest of anybody. So I believe that ultimately that the Nigerians are going to go to the polls, they are going to make their decision, and whatever that decision is, we'll see to a, a new beginning for Nigeria. But then the omens don't look very good. I mean, they have been targeted uh, attacks against INEC facilities, and in fact, uh, the, the INEC authorities had made it clear that if these attacks continue, particularly with the ferocity with which uh, they had been uh, uh, going on, uh, that might have impact on their conduct of the election. So surely um, that there must be something uh, that you, you, you would have thought about about this. Because again, these are the things that are going to make what you've told me already in this interview possible. If people are not able to come out and vote, I mean, let's use Anambra's election for an example. Less than 10% of the electorate turned out uh, to vote in Anambra. And so it raised questions about the legitimacy of whoever was declared winner, because at the end of the day, who elected that person? And that was a, re a result of security challenges. So it is against that background that I'm asking you the question. Well, the Nigerian constitution does not have threshold for election. So even if 100 people come out for the, to vote, uh, a winner will be declared. We don't have a rule that says 50% of the voter, registered voters must turn out. So that for me is, is where I say that despite the challenges, Nigerians in many states, in many local governments, in all the wards in Nigeria will come out despite the challenges to vote. Because in places like Spain, at the height of the, FARC, of the rebels issues in Spain, in Northern Ireland, in Colombia, under the FARC rebels, people still went out and voted because they realized that they cannot have a government interminably, uh, indeterminably. So um, I believe that Nigerians are going to come out and vote. Whether that will lead to suppression of votes, lower voter turnout, is something that we will uh, see as the days come by. But I believe that the elections will hold. Nigerians are going to vote, even if it is in the safe locations, um, but it's going to be across the country, people will vote because they know that this is a constitutional challenge. If we don't vote, then there is a, a big constitutional crisis facing us as a nation. How about vote trading? That is the practice of buying and selling votes, which we have oh, seen in previous elections. Time. I think it's going to always be, um, it's going to for some time as the voter education increases, it's going to be an issue majorly in local elections. Because at the scale of the presidency, when you now try to want to give money to 28 million, 30 million people, then the money becomes difficult to distribute. Uh, in terms of local elections, we are going to see that as a, a, a phenomenon. And that, is, that speaks to something. As far as the way I look at vote buying, I don't look at it as a negative externality in Nigeria. I look at it as a positive step in our, in our development. Before, politicians were giving the money to INEC and security officers because you are going to write the results at the, um, you are going to write the results at the collation centers. But the fact that we are now buying votes suggests that voters now matter. People have to figure out how to get to the voters. So from buying the votes, it will get to the point where we will now have to do something for the voters to trust you, to believe in you, and to vote for you. If not that the voters matter, 
Maybe we will not be talking about a Labour, can a Labour candidate, P2B, will not be an issue in the election. But because we now know that voters matter, that people are going to vote for who they believe in, or that people can be bought to vote, means that the politicians have accepted that election rigging at the level of INEC officers and police officers are no more, no more possible. The game is now at the polling unit. The game is now with the voters. So if you are a governor, you will have to do everything to make sure that you are aligned with your people so that they can vote for you. Like I told you, in Bauchi, we voted out an incumbent governor. In, in Adamawa, they voted out an incumbent governor. In Oshun, they voted out an incumbent governor. That is a credit to the growing awareness of Nigerians that the voters matter. So it's not only in giving the voters money, but in delivering public goods that will make majority of the voters come out looking forward to vote for a particular candidate. So I think it's a step in our evolution from giving the money to INEC and police and um, this to now giving the money to the voters and to now delivering value to the voters will be the next stage. And then, of course, we have to deal with the issue of the courts, how they interpret election petitions and co, so that the will of the people continues to triumph at all the time, at all times in Nigeria. That was actually going to be my next question. Uh, quite a number of people have pointed it out that uh, at the end of all the campaigning, politicking and so on, because our system basically is a winner take all one, uh, many people feel aggrieved uh, and they don't take to losing very kindly. So the cuts are kept very, very busy uh, during uh, the aftermath of the electoral process itself. And that at the end of the day, it is the courts who end up in many instances determining who was elected and who wasn't elected, not the electorate. So at the end of the day, the courts are serving more or less like the electorate. Well, that's part of our constitution. That's part of our process that, you know, people have to go to the courts to resolve issues. And I think it's a credible part of democracy. What is at issue is the integrity of the process. The judiciary must continue to evolve they must continue to intensify oversight of judges to make sure that the judges are guided by the law and not by any pecuniary benefits. Once people believe that justice is done in the courts, uh, people will accept it because it is a part of the electoral process. Um, if there are issues with an election, we cannot take to the streets. We have to go to the courts to resolve it. And I believe that the courts are, are the right arbiter to determine whether the rules have been followed to determine whether the person that won was validly elected. Uh, those are issues that are before judges and they're going to take those decisions. And I think that it, 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 is, it is the proper way to go in a democracy. What do you make of the 2022 Electoral Act? It's a massive improvement. Um, and I believe that if we abide by the letters and the spirit, it will lead to cleaner election. Given, given that the other thing that has happened in this particular election is the use of social media. And I emphasize the word clean in your last description about what uh, type of electoral process that you hope the Electoral Act will bring about. Social media uh, has come uh, to play quite an important role in this particular election. Uh, it does uh, appear as if everybody uh, uh, is using it and perhaps not altogether positively. Um, someone, one of my guests on this program had pointed out that uh, Social media was being used to demarket quite a number of the candidates, and most of the time the demarketing was false. Uh, but that the problem is about holding those who are doing it to account. Well, um, that is why it is the word media is prefaced with social. Um, so once it is a social engagement, I don't think that there is end to how much misinformation, disinformation, false news that will come about it. What is important is that um, we con media organizations, even like yours, will continue to invest in fact-checking methods, and people will, over time, determine which are the credible outlets to get information that they can trust. But um, beyond that, there is going to be, continue to be this violation. But then, what is important is that the fact that a crime is committed on the cyberspace does not preclude the person from going through our normal laws. So if people identify those who um, tarnish their image, who demarket them unfairly, who um, publish malicious and damaging or libelous information, our laws are still there to take care of those individuals. And I think it's a learning curve. 
people are going to begin to get uh, more aware that the cyberspace does not provide immunity from uh, legal action. One area which seems not to have gotten uh, a lot of attention uh, from the candidates, at least not publicly, uh, is, the, is the one of, uh, of foreign policy. And this, uh, we have been told, ties in with quite a number of even the domestic challenges we are facing, uh, for example, in terms of security, that uh, because we do not have a targeted uh, uh, follow-through policy uh, with our neighbors, for example, uh, quite a number of things happening in those countries tend to arrive in Nigeria before we start reacting, whereas we could have possibly acted to contain some of those things in, uh, in, in, in those countries before they become a serious problem for us. Um, do you think we have a problem with our foreign policy? And if so, what will be PDP's position uh, should you, should you, uh, be, uh, should you be uh, forming the next government? Well, um, if you notice, Elijah uh, Atiku Abubakar has been mixing with, have been meeting with leaders across West Africa. He has been engaging the international community. Uh, we think that Nigeria retreated over the past seven years in our foreign policy engagement. We used to be very robust in the international space, and we would think that we need to restore Nigeria back to where the PDP was in terms of engagement with global leaders. Um, if you remember in the PDP years, you know, the American presidents were here, uh, whether it's Bill Clinton, George Bush, they all came to Nigeria. Nigeria was a significant destination for world leaders uh, because of the robust engagement um, of the PDP uh, with the international community. So we're going to return that. Um, first of all, by engaging with our neighbors, uh, it's very important that we continue to engage with our neighbors. And it's very important that we also understand the soft power of Nigeria. Uh, that soft power is in our music, is in our arts, is in our movie industry that we've been exporting around the world. And um, we need to enhance that soft power. We need to tell the Nigerian story differently. We need to re-engage the world differently. We need to showcase the beauty, the sights and sounds of Nigeria by restoring our internal security, by mobilizing Nigerians to once again believe in the unity and the effectiveness of the Nigerian state, we hope that our foreign policy will not just be words, but will also be um, a, a reaffirmation of the power of Nigeria to be a leading black nation uh, in the world. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Osita Chidoka, for your perspective, for your frankness at times, and uh, of course, for your deep analysis uh, of the issues on the program today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.